Okay. It's 5 30. Let's go ahead and start the meeting, please. Uh, roll call. Commissioner Eastman? Here. Commissioner Junior? Here. Commissioner Sobek? Here. Commissioner Wells? Mayor Ward? Here. Uh, if you want to participate in the prayer and pledge allegiance, please stand. Lord God, thank you for this meeting tonight. And Lord, we thank you for the spring. Thank you for the green that we see and the flowers and the renewal. And Lord, we thank you for the renewal you give us and new life. And we pray, Lord, for that new life to spread all over our city. That you bring renewal even in the, the systems of the city. And you'd help us all just to experience that new life. And Lord, we thank you for our firefighters and the saving that they bring to our city. And Lord, we thank you for the beautiful homes we have, and we pray even for more of that. Lord, that you bring prosperity, good jobs, and good homes to our community. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor. I move that we approve the agenda as printed. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Any discussion on it? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 The agenda's approved. Uh, awards and proclamations. I have the first uh, uh, proclamation. I don't think anybody's here for the Fair Housing Month in, in Arc City, so I'll just go ahead and read it from here. Uh, celebrating 51 years of fair housing, whereas the Congress of the United States passed the Civil uh, Rights Act in 1968, of which Title VIII declared that the law of the land now would guarantee the rights and equal housing opportunity, and whereas the city of Arkansas City is committed to the mission and intent of Congress to provide fair and equal housing opportunities for all. And today, many rely realty companies and associations support fair housing laws and whereas the fair housing groups of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development have through the years received thousands of complaints and uh, uh, alleged illegal housing discrimination and found too many that have proved upon investigation to be violations of the fair housing laws and whereas equal opportunity are whereas equal housing opportunity is condition of the life of our city that can and should be achieved. Now, therefore, uh, I, <coughs> Jay Warren, mayor of the city of Arkansas City, do designate the month of April 2019 as Fair Housing Month and in the city of Arkansas City, Kansas, and express the hope that this year's observance will promote fair housing practices throughout the city, county, or Cali County, Kansas, and the United States of America. And the second one is the National Volunteers Week. I think we've got Center, the Northwest Community Center, the 
the Senior Citizen Center, the Escanola Conservancy, the Berkeley Theater of Arts, and numerous civic, uh, civic groups and services and organizations, and whereas the volunteers play a critical role in increasing the disaster preparedness, cleaning up neighborhoods, enhancing the social connections between the different sectors, building the bridges for the government, and making a safer and stronger community by increasing the communication between government and neighborhoods. Now, therefore, I, Jay Warren, Mayor of the City of Arkansas City, do, my, do hereby proclaim and recognize that April 7th through the 13th, 2019, as National Volunteer Week in the City of Arkansas City, Kansas, and urge my fellow citizens to recognize the crucial role played by volunteers in our community. I further call upon and urge all citizens to consider becoming more involved as volunteers. The upcoming opportunities to learn more and help out this week include Spring Clean Up Day from 8 a.m. to noon, April the 6th, 2019, at Wilson Park in Arkansas City, and the National Volunteer Week kickoff event from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the same day at Island Park in Winfield. Okay, we're on number three, recognition of visitors. Recognize and graduate recently promoted captain or promoted captains, lieutenants, and sergeants for the Arkansas City Police Department. Commissioner, Mayor, it's uh, my honor tonight to recognize five individuals who are recently promoted within the police department. Uh, with retirement recently from uh, Captain McCaslin, it opened up a series of promotions. And if you remember, we were budgeted this year to move one officer position to a sergeant position for our investigations unit. So we had uh, quite a series of promotional processes that, that took place. During that process, uh, we took a look at our organizational structure and we saw an opportunity to make some changes department-wide. Under our new structure, the department will be divided into two separate divisions. One captain will oversee the operations division, which will consist of the four patrol chiefs, and a second captain will oversee the support services division, which will consist of investigations, community policing, records, animal control, evidence, and accreditation. Uh, we believe this restructure will be able to give us better communication throughout the department and also uh, more coordination of services so we can move forward. Uh, we have promotional processes throughout the month of February and March, and as a result of the promotional process for captain, lieutenant, and sergeant, uh, we have these uh, five individuals who were promoted. So, as I call out your name, please step forward. Captain Holloway. Captain Holloway has been with the police department for 25 years and has served as a patrol officer, field training officer, corporal, sergeant, patrol lieutenant, and detective lieutenant. Captain Holloway has completed an array of leadership schools, including Central State Law Enforcement Executive Leadership Seminar, the Kansas Police Administrator Seminar, Wichita University Supervisor Course, Supervisor's Role in Managing the Use of Force Seminar, Executive Command Leadership Workshop, and Coaching Skills for Managers and Supervisors Course. Additionally, Captain Holloway has hundreds of hours of specialized training in the area of criminal investigations. Captain Burr. Captain Burr has been with the department for 22 years, and he has served as a patrol officer, 
school resource officer, field training officer, detectives, patrol sergeant, patrol lieutenant, and accreditation manager. Captain Burr has completed an array of leadership schools, including the Central State Law Enforcement Executive Leadership Seminar, Kansas Police Administrator Seminar, FBI Media and Public Relations Seminar, Police Officer Recruiter Boot Camp, Human Traffic Train the Trainer Course, Use of Force Liability Instructor Course, Kalia Accreditation Manager Training, and Laws of Leadership Challenging the Organizational Culture Seminar. Lieutenant Turnus. Lieutenant Turnus has been with the police department for 22 years. He has served as acting lieutenant for the past four years. Additionally, he has served as an officer, a corporal, field training officer, school resource officer, school resource officer supervisor, SWAT team assistant team leader, and sergeant. Lieutenant Turnus has completed an array of leadership schools, including FBI Supervisor Leadership Institute for Law Enforcement Executives, FBI Command Institute for Law Enforcement Executives, Central States Law Enforcement Executive Leadership Seminar, the Kansas Police Administrator Seminar, and Wichita State University Supervisors Course. Sergeant Stroud. Sergeant Stroud has been with the police department for 16 years and has served as a dispatcher, police officer, field training officer, master police officer, and SWAT team member. SWAT team member. <laughs> <laughs> Sergeant Stroud has completed an array of leadership trainings, including basic supervision, inspirational trustworthy leadership seminar, laws of leadership, challenging the law enforcement organization seminar, the Blue Courage seminar, and the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Association Supervisors Institute. Sergeant Douglas. Sergeant Douglas has been with the police department for 12 years and has served as a patrol officer, field training officer, master police officer, and detective. Sergeant Douglas also has an executive management experience in the private retail sector uh, prior to becoming a police officer. Sergeant Douglas is an instructor for the department in the areas of defensive tactics and police baton. Sergeant Douglas has extensive training in the areas uh, and experience in areas of investigation, interviewing, and interrogation. Please join me in congratulating these individuals for their hard work and dedication. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Yeah. This, uh, really excited about the, uh, the new structure. We actually uh, we started the promotional process and we had outside agencies come and help us. And Andover, which is basically the exact same size and structure as ours, uh, had recently moved to the two captains structure because of accreditation. And, uh, when they told me that, I just thought, well, this is a great idea. And so I started doing some more research and found that quite a few agencies that were accredited have the two uh, command staff like that. And uh, so we've done it. And so far, uh, we're, what, four weeks into it? And uh, it's working out really well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Looks good. Thanks yeah. Thank you. Thanks Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Number two on the recognition of visitors, recognize our Kansas City uh, Fire Department Captain Chet Renzall for the graduating from the National Fire Academy and Managing Officer Program. Mayor and City Commission, it's an honor here to recognize Captain Chet Renzall for his completion of the Managing Officer Program through the United, United States Fire Administration and National Fire Academy. The management, Managing Officer Program is designed to provide company-level fire EMS officers with a broad perspective of today's fire and EMS management, leadership, and administration. The Managing Officer Program goals are to promote and enhance the professional growth of fire service leadership while preparing future leaders through a combination of education and linking people with ideas. Captain Ranzel received instruction on leadership, 
community risk reduction, the firefighter and community safety, an analytical tool for decision making. The captain also gained insight concerning response planning and incident management. It was a two year program where he had to go back to the National Fire Academy. So, Chet, on behalf of the United States Fire Administration, National Fire Academy, I'd like to recognize you for your successful completion of the requ requisite courses of study for the National Fire Academy under the authority of granted by the 115th Congress of the United States of America and awards the certificate of completion for the Managing Officer Program. Do you have anything to say? Already. <laughs> He's hanging it up on the wall. Well, maybe he can go back to school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I met with Nick and uh, with Marla on part of my capstone project that uh, I had to do for completion of this. Um, that I instituted at the station to help reduce the risk of cancer and um, uh, health safety awareness at the station. So, again, thank you for your. Thank you for your dedication. Yeah. Before we move on, I just want to tell the commission thank you for allowing us to budget for training for all the different departments because without that, you know, them making attending all these different academies and, and sessions would not be possible without the uh, generous um, contributions that the commission allows us to make for for them individually so it's definitely that um, they definitely appreciate it and then we will continue hopefully uh, getting all these folks trained up and make sure that we have the best possible people in the right position so well it makes a better you. and safe community by right. getting that kind of training yeah you know in the tough budget years um, it's very easy for a lot of communities to cut the training and that was something that we preached from the get-go is whatever you do do not cut training Cut equipment for a few years, cut other projects, but never cut training because all you do is just get yourself further behind. I think that's proved itself even with police saving several people in the last couple of months and fire department keeping control on fires to break out. So it's very evident. Thank you. Okay, number four, comments or comments from the audience that's not on the agenda. I think Sid, you signed up to just come on up here and Thank you. I'm Sid Rainier. I live at thirteen twenty six North C Street here in Kansas City. Uh, today I was out driving around and was kind of surprised when I was on the 77 bypass between Chestnut and Kansas. Uh, the city of North Kansas City has a dropping track around there, and believe it or not, there were three or four areas of snow there that had been burned, and I don't know when it was burned, but there was still snow there, and uh, kind of bothered me a little bit, because somebody could probably say, well, you people were doing it was okay for me, but anyway. And if you look uh, northeast of our Kansas City several miles, you would have seen smoke in the air yeah. on the fire up there. But anyway, uh, that's what I had to say. Uh, you want to do something on this? Sure. Okay. Uh, I read in the paper this morning about the uh, item that's uh, between Kansas and Radio Lane for traffic. Uh, and uh, Anyway, I, I noticed on your agenda you're going to have an update on it, and uh, I don't think we're going to make a decision today, but I would like to raise several issues that I would hope you could think about. Um, first of all, uh, between August and May, we have middle school traffic, Jefferson Elementary traffic, the high school traffic, medical lodging.
have this example today in front of my house from about 3 to 3.30. I have 84 cars drive up and down the front of my house today. And I know most of them are picking up their kids. And I have uh, 63 students walk by my house, which is down. Normally, I get about 70 cars under my foot. Uh, I worry about what was broken in the paper about single lanes because of the fire department, uh, emergency medical, the police, the sheriffs. When they put people over and have to go through this and where the traffic is designed, the way I understood it, I think we're going to have real problems. Uh, then the other item that brings up is Westar Energy and Cass Transit Gas Service in the city of Los Angeles City. When we have to do work, on that street, and we're going to be with the truck out there on the street with red um, paint around it. And how are we going to get around? It's going to be funky. Anyway, um, I just uh, want you to think about all of these things. Uh, for example, when you come north down Summit Street and you hit Radio Lane, you're going to be from two. Um, lanes to one. When you go north on Summit Street at Kansas, you're going to be from two lanes to one. <coughs> and those to me look like they would solve or create some problems on those people. Um, I do have a uh, solution. Uh, I mentioned it many years ago here at the city commission meeting. Uh, you ought to disband left-hand turn signal, or turn signal uh, from uh, Madison to Radio Lane. And uh, this would solve a lot of issues. Anyway, thank you, and uh, I appreciate it. And uh, if uh, I can uh, help you in any way when we talk about this issue sometime, I'll be happy to come and listen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Sid. Uh, there's somebody signed underneath uh, Sid, but they don't, there's no name. I don't know if that's. Is that I think it is Sid. Oh, okay, Sid. All right. Sid. Okay. Yeah, okay, Sid. Ken Herder. Mayor, commissioners, uh, I wanted to speak tonight about the uh, exit on uh, First Street from the proposed Burger King. I was at the uh, March 12th Planning Commission meeting, and I don't see the builder here, Mr. Wolf. He spoke that night, and there was a lot of discussion, and discussion from the audience. And what I would like to say is, no one's against Burger King coming into town that I spoke to. And we're, me personally, and a lot of them I've talked to, not against it going at that location. It's a putting the traffic exit and out on the first street. And those people will be impacted from that day forward. It'll, it'll only get worse. And they're on level ground coming out of there, the headlights will go right in their front rooms, their bedrooms, the noise levels. And I'm speaking from experience here on my location, where I live. So they're gonna have increased traffic on their street, which I have a lot already. <coughs> and it was proposed right turn in, right turn out to come out of that business. And it won't be enforced. Even with signage, you can't enforce it. I'm speaking from experience. Uh, so you're always going to have that traffic issue there. Mr. Wolf spoke to the Planning Commission and said that he did not need that first street exit to move forward with that site, that he could use that site <coughs> without that exit on the first street. He told that to the Planning Commission and us in the audience. 
So, with that, I'd like to give you a little history of what has transpired in the last three years where I'm at. And the promises that the city made during the zoning appeal board meetings, which there were two, and the city granted two zoning variances to the dollar store. And one of them that's a big impact on us is changing the setback from 30 feet to 14 feet. That sets the business and the backside of that right on the street, almost, and the dumpster is right on the back side. So that was the first zoning variance they give them, and the second one was on sign, square footage of lighted sign on the front, which wasn't as big an impact as the setback. But they told us typical store hours would be nine to nine that they would generate about 80 vehicles a day. There's that many in an hour. You take after work in the evening after them kids get out of school, families are going home, they, they can't hardly, you know, there's 80 an hour anyway for several hours, two or three hours. And on some good days when the weather's real nice, it's like that. Some days all day long. That's a long ways from what they kept the developer, the builder, zoning appeal board, even the commission. Mr. White, Josh got up and spoke and repeated all this that I'm giving you here, 80 a day. Well, in my mind, even at the time, I thought, how can a store like that even exist on 80 sales a day when they're probably average sales of them at $10? You know, yeah, I laughed too, Dan. I, I thought that was uh, a good one. So anyway, we were concerned about that exit onto us because that dumps right in my front yard. That street's 28 foot wide. I'm looking at everything all day long if I'm outside or if I'm in front of my home, which we moved in from Lover's Lane to retire. We bought that house in 05, 2005. So we was concerned about lights. They shine in my house. They come out and turn the wrong direction. They hit the apex of the street and the lights are elevated and they shine right into it even though we're elevated on that side of the street. So we'll have that forever. And the trash. We were promised that they would be fence around the trash, 90% screenage in the gates so you can't see it. Well, they didn't put the screenage in the gates. I had to come before the commission and ask for that. We were told by the builder, these were promises made, that they'd be a raised median going in and out to direct the traffic so that you come in one way, go out one way. And these were things we were told. They would be signage. Well, they poured all the concrete and built the building. They didn't put no raised media in it. I had to come back before the commission and plead to get that media built. Well, let me tell you what they put in there is no media like you would see in Wichita or anywhere that you'd go where businesses have media to direct traffic in and out and around the neighborhood. That didn't happen either. So, and then with the signage, when we had so much, nobody obeying the signage, I come back before the commission asking for help. We can't enforce the signage. You, you talk about getting your bubble broke every time I come back here for a while in those years, three years ago, it's pretty depressing. <coughs> that we were made these promises. Also, and I remember distinctly, Mr. Eastman, at the uh, vote the night on uh, the uh, site study that I had got on the agenda and asked for the 
have a site study on traffic. <coughs> and it was voted down that they, the commission didn't want to spend the money that was required to do the site study. Mr. Eastman, you apologized for the increased traffic and the lights and the noise, but it was already built and it was already done and there's nothing we could do. Those were your words. Well, I'm asking you now that something can be done now. And even Mr. Warren, Mr. Mayor, you said on the site study that maybe in three years time, we can look at this again, we can review this and see what's going on. We're here and it's been three years and the city is about to do it again to those neighbors on that street over which is only a block from me. I'm in the 1300 block, they're in the 1400 block. Just cause it's across Cannes Avenue, it doesn't change anything. The <coughs> thing I learned from the planning commission last month that kind of hit me was uh, the city's been kind of having this in the works since 2000 of using 1st Street and A Street as frontage roads. And even one of the uh, <coughs> planning commissioners spoke said we've had this problem with Summit Street for a long time. All we're doing is taking it from here and putting it on them. Now think about that. We got a problem here on Summit, but Mr. Herriter gets to inherit a piece of it. We're going to give it to them. I mean that's that's the way we feel about it when we live in these neighborhoods <coughs> where this is happening. One other thing I want to comment on before I show you something that I have here is on the trash, on those gates, that has been an ongoing problem for three years. Those trash dumpster gates weren't built right to start with. I brought it to Nick's attention several times. So I sat there and watched them build that. We live there, I'm retired, I watched that thing go up. Well, the subcontractor, whoever put the uh, dumpster area in, put the gates and the posts in, and those are big eight inch steel posts, he ran out of cement, he put it all on one side, and when he put the other one in, he just dug the hole in that sandy loam and dropped that eight inch piece of pipe in there and put no cement in. Them gates have sagged for three years and drug on the ground. City employees that's running your trash wagons, two of them would lean into that gate with their shoulders to open it and close it. I'm sitting here watching this thinking, boy, this is crazy. And I brought it to the attention of people, nothing happened. So what happens is sometimes when uh, the city employees would open that gate, if you push that gate all the way open until you hit the bump stops on the hinges, the pipe rotate in the ground. So then when you close that gate, you could have a gap between them two gates that far. Well, then the latch don't work. You can't close it. You can't secure it. Well, I went over and adjusted those gates a couple times to no end because if they open the gate too far, it's out of adjustment again and then it's open. So, what I did after January the 1st of this year, uh, to be honest about it, I had a belly full. I, it was bothering me. So I went over and spoke to the store manager and says, Maria, would you let me fix those gates? I said, they need wheels under the ends of those gates to support the weight. Those are long gates for the way they was built. No concrete in that one post. She said, well, yeah, it'd be all right. So I bought industrial wheels, mounted them under those gates. I dug that post up on the left side and put five sacks of quick creek concrete in it, put reinforcing rods and drilled holes through that pipe so that when the concrete's set up, there's no way they're gonna rotate that pipe in there and those gates will get out of adjustment. Let me tell you, those drivers, and I think Mike Crandall can speak to that. They kind of like having a gate that they can open and close. And I tell you, them girls at that store like it. They've never had it so good. 
that should have been done from day one. That was a promise that was made and didn't happen. But the trouble we was having, people go in there at night and dig through them dumpsters. She has certain days a week that they put a lot of stuff out and fill it up. Well, I guess there's a culture in town that knows when that happens and they're there at night in the middle of the night right next to Mrs. Marshall. I mean, you could spit on her house from where that dumpster's at. They're in there at night digging, and when they go through that, they shotgun stuff everywhere, all over the ground. The gates are left open. And when the wind blows from the south and hits that building, it goes east or west. Dan lives in a building there that you can walk out south, go to Brick, and about get blown over sometimes. Well, that's the way that building is, and that's the way the trash goes. So what I did, I picked all that trash up. This was about the first week of January and all the Christmas sale signs and the stickers was in my yard. They blowed out of there. And I went to the police department and filed a police report. Document it. I've been told you gotta document it. I didn't wanna do that, but that's what I done. And so Mr. McGee was the officer, very nice. I filled out the report. And I asked him, I said, can you send a copy of that report to the city manager so that he'll be aware and know that we're still having issues with that dumpster area? He said, yes, I can do that. I'll do that today. If he did that, I never heard from the city manager. That's why I went ahead and approached the manager at that dollar store if she'd let me fix that. Well, I fixed it, and they're still getting in there at night. So I went back to the store manager, and I asked Maria, I said, if I buy chain and padlocks, get a dozen keys made, I'll go to Mike Crandall and ask him if he'd be good enough if the, give those to the drivers, would it be an issue? because I didn't want that locked up and they come in at 7.30 in the morning. They don't want to change their schedule and come in at 10 o'clock and then go get the store manager and get a key to get in. Very helpful. That, you cannot believe the difference since we've done that. We don't have people crawling over in there and digging and throwing stuff out that goes in our neighborhood. I shouldn't have had to done that. That should have been right from the beginning and it wasn't, but my point here is, is on trash and traffic, and one other thing I'd like to show you a couple things here is uh, before I quit, if you don't mind, at the Zoning Appeal Board meetings, at commission meetings, we were told all deliveries would be during store hours. Last month, two of them were nighttime deliveries. And I'm not beating up this dollar store because they're a business that come to town and the city's the one that set this up. And we were supposed to have protection from zoning codes and different things, and we were made a lot of promise. I'm not beating up on that dollar store or those people there whatsoever. Or Burger King, because they want to go in where they want to go in. That's not the issue. The issue is First Street. But the promise is made, so what happens is they'll come in at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, the dollar store across from me. They'll park on the south side of the store. If it's cold weather, the truck's running all night. They leave all the marker lights on, which is probably a safety thing because if cars come shooting through there like they mm -hmm. cut the sun yeah. or cut out, they'd run into their truck. Some mornings they'll start unloading 4.30 in the morning. Some mornings 5.30. Last month it was two out of four deliveries were like what I'm showing them there. It's been running about one and a half out of four <coughs> deliveries or nighttime deliveries with the truck laying there all night. Now, I'm not asking this commission to run out to them and say, you can't do that no more. They came to town 
ask him to be here. This commission, planning commission, zoning appeal board commission, city staff were the one that made all the promises. That's where I stand on that. And what I'm asking here tonight is that this commission considering challenging staff to address this to where we can come to something we can live with. Now, Mr. Wolf told you he didn't need that first street exit, that he could move forward with that site, and he was pleased with that site. He wants that site. I really don't want to see anybody jammed up that might already think they got that sold. That's not fair to those people either, the way this works. I, I don't want to see that either. But what I'm asking is that gates be put in where I live, and if her truck, they get one truck a week, that's another deception that was played on us during this, is we were told one delivery truck a week. There's four semis come a week and four box trucks come a week. And this morning, a big 40-foot trailer, it's a vendor, come down Summit, come across Kansas at that Y, which is real tight, cross there, come into the back of the store like they always do. There is signage there, but one thing that stuck in my mind that Tamara said one night that I'll never forget. Those are suggestions. I'm still having trouble dealing with that because I can go online and I can read the DMV for taking a driver's license test in the state of Kansas and what's required of the applicant to take that test. I'm not going to recite it to you. It is there. Must be obeyed. If you have any questions, fire away. Oh, one other thing here. You know, it's hard for me to remember all this, but foot traffic. That's another thing that the uh, developer was emphasizing the builder. Foot traffic, you know, to the store. That's great, unless they come from 2nd Street and walk between your properties, come up the alley and walk between your house and your neighbor's house, and this goes on when the weather's nice. This goes on all the time. And one other note, and it, it, I saved the best for last. Back there at the dumpster area, there's the masonry wall, and then there's the wood around the dumpster. There's a narrow gap that goes through there. That's where they go to urinate when they got to use the bathroom in the daytime. You can see it. We set it out in front of our place. We don't like seeing all this. All we asked for in the beginning and I told Josh this several times, we're not against business coming in town. We wasn't against that dollar store going there. I told him that repeatedly. We just wanted that wall so we wouldn't have the trash. If they're not responsible at that store for keeping cleaned up, then it's on their parking lot. It's in their area. And we're not looking at it. We're not seeing it. Thank you very much for listening. Do you have any questions? Who urinates there? Just Customers, customers, people, walking in, walking out. Huh. And another thing is that store has no uh, waste uh, cans outside. I'll call them cans, but receptacles, trash receptacles. No public receptacles. Yes. You know, you come out of your store, you got yes. your sales receipt in your hand. I'm going to throw it in. Candy bar wrappers. Oh, man. Got oh, lots of those. I could uh, wallpaper my whole house with candy bar wrappers. Good but idea. <laughs> they will come out and sit down on the south side of that building in the summertime, especially because the sun's in this part of the hemisphere, and there's some shade on the south side. They're drinking their soda they bought. They're eating their beef jerky they bought. Their candy bars. And guess what? When they get up and walk away, still laying there on the ground. These are the things we're dealing with with that business being there. And I'm not against the business. I actually started trading there a little bit in the last four or five months because I tried to let that manager know how I felt. And that's another thing here. They said, 
we want to be good neighbors. They promoted that time and time again. Family Dollar wants to be good neighbors. This was brought to commission meetings, zoning appeal board meetings. You know, I felt like I'd been talked to by a car salesman, a used car salesman. That's kind of what it felt like. I know you're tired of me. And I think I've covered everything pretty good. But this is a history, and there's going to be some of that history repeated over there. And with those exits, let me tell you, you're inviting larger trucks and vehicles to come in. When you put that exit on the first street there in the 1400 block, that invites bigger rigs to try to get in there. We have the uh, ADM milling down here, the mills. They haul those big grain trucks. Guess what? They come across Cannes Avenue at night and come right in there in front of me and pull in there and park the shop. But if we didn't have that opening there and had that gated off with something that looked nice, or just build that wall and you can still leave it where foot traffic can come in. Don't cut the customers off. I'll have to deal with some of them walking through my property, but a lot of people don't have the money. I think a lot of those people can't afford automobiles, but they'll walk to that store. So if you build another masonry wall like what's there, but move it back so the sidewalk lets it come in, you can solve most of that problem. That's, I ask you, to task the manager and city staff. Let's think this thing out and this one that you're about to do that to over there. You know, I guess I like you guys. I told you I was about done. Well, one other item here to show you, and I've got it. I got my uh, tax appraisal this year like you all did. May I show this to you? Sure. So when I got this, the second page has what it is now. I went and got a appeal. Went out and talked to a county appraiser. I asked him if uh, I told him what my situation is in front of me. He said, you know, we've already got a bunch of calls on Burger King. I didn't even bring it up. But he said, property owners have been calling us on Burger King. I said, really? So I showed him my photos and uh, told him the story, kind of like I told you here this evening, what, how we've been impacted. He says, I think we can help you. I said, would you come down to my neighborhood and walk this over and look at this? He said, yes, I will. He said, next week, you know, he showed up the next day. I was impressed. He said he'd talk to his supervisors, and they have a special scale for property owners that are impacted by something like I've been impacted. If you're looking for a tax base mm -hmm. to get here on the front side, but we're taking it all off the back side, you're not gaining anything. Besides destroying people's values on their property. That is $18,000 from what it was in January to what my value is today on that home where I live. That is a significant number on about an 88 Would you sell your home for eighty-eight thousand dollars? I tell you what, Nick, I'd let you buy me out, but I'd have to have what I got invested in it because when I retired, we remodeled and did a lot of work and put that in it because that's where we was going to live. We was going to take our last breath there, me and my wife. Mm -hmm. Just to let you know, we've been married fifty-five years, and that's where we plan to cash in, and we're done there. So that's what I looked at. But that all changed three years ago for us. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, I would consider you could have it.
then you could sell it, and then you could recoup what you could, and I'd go along, and maybe you wouldn't hear from me again. <laughs> I'm just saying, I think I could probably find you a buyer at 88000 Oh, yeah, you might. But that's not what I got in it, Nick. Because we remodeled and did things to make it. So it's us. worth more than 88000 It depends on who you are. Well, I'm just saying. You want to live in front of that store? Would you want to move down there and take my place for a year? Would anyone on this commission like to trade 12 months with me and deal with what I deal with? I, I don't see a lot of you out there picking trash up and, and uh, trucks with Christmas tree lights on all night long. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank Study. you. Challenge city staff. Yeah, on that wall he was talking about behind there, there's is there any way to, I mean, block that thing off or not? Fill the hole? No. Well, we'd have to give a family dollar. They'd have to make that decision on their own to go ahead and do that. If there's a gap or whatever, I'd have to, I'm no, not even aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I know, uh, well, Dottie talked to the builder as a citizen. She went ahead and did that, and I know they were going to make the fence around the trash can eight feet instead of six. Move the trash can away from the back of the street. I know he, she worked on some of that because she talked to the property owners. I don't remember all of the things she said, but she, I was appreciative of her work as a citizen just to help maybe not have these problems, but uh, we, we just need to make, is there anything we could have done to make these promises have teeth? I don't remember anyone making promises. I, I mean, I mean I'm not I'm in the sure business they, of making promises. But I'm sure the developer said those kind of things. Like, we won't have, we'll have I one. I have the minutes of the meeting. It's all been black. Yeah, the black. one delivery, we'll have one delivery a, a, a week or so. And then that gets into if the I mean, we develop, we, we check the work the developer does. If it's on the plans, it has to be done according to the plans. And from that point on, that's a, it's a citizen issue, citizen and business issue from that point forward. So in order for if, if if Burger King does have trash issues, it's up to the residents that live near there. Absolutely. Burger it's King. the same with like McDonald's trash. I mean, Arby's trash, Sonic trash. I mean, every business in town. It all depends on the business. I mean, you look at right. Some, 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 some businesses, they do look, a great they job look and meticulous some don't, outside yep. and some leave a lot of trash to blow down the alley. Yep. Which that Just could depends. be could be a littering issue, um, which could be prosecuted in municipal court. Could be a um, private action for nuisance from a property owner to the business if it's creating a nuisance. Um, but our role essentially, once it's built to plans and we issue the certificate of occupancy, that's usually when our, our role is over, other than enforcing property maintenance issues or, or other yeah. municipal codes that may arise mm -hmm. after the fact. What about the masonry wall that Mr. Hurd was talking about with the five family yeah. dollar? Well, What's he it? was saying that would block. Well, I don't think you couldn't make family dollar do that. No, Not you anymore. couldn't. We'd have to get permission from family dollar to do it if we decided to well, do it. They, they couldn't because they only have one driveway in the front and one in the back. So family dollars, mm -hmm. they have to use that. Yeah. Burger King would have two front drives. Traffic's actually meant to go come from Summit around the around the restaurant and go back out the other. You know, come in one side and go back out the other. It's a little bit different. And is that is that setup. something city staff also heard that they don't need that first? Street? Never. That's the first I've ever heard that. Did you ever hear that, Josh? Exactly. No. Not exactly. I never <laughs> heard it. What they said to you. I've never heard that. They came up obviously at that. said that it's possible that it's something that would affect the job so he didn't say you're talking about the family daughter or daughter no, he's talking about Burger King. Burger King. so where is are we expecting Burger King to have some sort of a device like the supposed pork chop that wasn't there there's no pork chop it's a ride out only 
um, on the immediate exit for the for the drive-through lane. So when okay. you look at the drive-through, you're going to see that exit right before you, and it's a ride-out only exit okay. right in front of the, the drive-through. If for some reason they want to go to the north, they'd have the opportunity to go to the north drive. But if traffic's really busy on Summit Street, honestly, the only way for them to get out then at that point is to try to go out on First Street, and that's why we actually had the other so drive right on First out. Street. That right, be, right out would be headed north. South. South only. Yeah. South only. And most people will probably go on south anyway. Yeah, most of them will go south. Most of them will try to, to go back to the north because they'll have to go around the building to the north end of the property and then try to cut across and, and get in the lane to go to the north. But the first street allows them to actually go around the building if they so choose. But honestly, no, it'd be a lot, I'm not very it. many because... She you know, it'd be, be, it, well, it'd be just like um, McDonald's. McDonald's, mm -hmm. they basically, everyone dumps out right away out of McDonald's parking lot, yeah, right yeah. on the radio lane. And they moved the building so they could dump out yeah. on radio lane. And it's worked out great. I think McDonald's is laid out very well. Yeah, and that's the I way we did with what we've suggested Burger King. how they feel. Is that's the best we can do it. And honestly, the number of vehicles going out the back uh, on the first street is going to be very minimal. Most of them are going to dump and just take that right out, um, just like they dump out right now uh, for um, uh, McDonald's. They're just so going to want to. You mean on there. Summit? It's going to be right only. There's yeah. there's two in, there's two entrances and exits. Well, there's one exit and one entrance exit on Summit Street, and so the north side of their lot will be an entrance exit. The north side. The north side. Of the uh, on oh, summit, on summit. Okay. right, and then on the south side, which is the side that the drive throughs out, that's a ride out only. Okay, what about on first? On well, first, it's an entrance exit on first street. That's what I was talking about on first. I thought you were saying on first was right out. No, only. no, no, first is in, in, entrance and exit on first summit. There's a ride out and then an entrance and an exit. Can you see your right? Did they say in the plan where the entrance exit on the back will be? Toward the north? Yeah, it's the on the north end. The north end, before mm -hmm. the drive through I suppose the drive through speaker is probably somewhere like that. Yeah, there's there's two drive through lanes. Okay, here and here. Something like that. Okay. And is this something that has to be, I mean, that study you were talking about, the traffic study? that hasn't been, have we done one for this site? We have the full traffic studies done by Kansas Department of Transportation. The full blown traffic study for the whole corridor has been completed. That was funded by KDOT, was done by Trans Systems. And that's where the suggestion comes in for all traffic because they're not talking about necessarily adding traffic to the summit corridor, <coughs> it's just shifting where it's entering and exiting on the summit corridor. So that's where that traffic study comes back, and which was done, I believe, about a year, year and a half ago, when the traffic study done. Mm -hmm. And that looks at three lanes, one going north, one going south, and then um, having the center turn lane. And that was a suggestion by the traffic engineers for the study. I've got the plan here. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, but I, it makes more sense after the description. But. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right now. <coughs> We move on. Yeah, let's. Uh, one more question. Uh, what about the gate behind there? You know where they shut. You know, there's on a family dog. Well, if gates are any proof of how well they're maintained, I think he pretty much answered how well gates are maintained. Then they hire him. They're not. Depends on the owner. Depends on the business. We could put a gate on there, but doesn't mean it's going to work a week later. Because we don't dictate, we don't dictate how it's designed, how much money they spend on the gate. The there. To the back end, exit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, we'll do some more talking about this thing again. So uh, just give us 
a little time to talk about it. Uh, let's go on to the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda. What's the personnel policy? On the updates, it shows you what's changed. The one that may have questions on is the CAPERS one. That's actually a change in CAPERS law that they actually, um, from day one, they're eligible. It used to be you had to wait a year. That actually changed in 2012? I don't remember exactly when it changed. Yeah, the last time that policy has been looked at was in 2009 or 2008. But those are, that's really the only change. <coughs> and then the other one was if individuals don't actually have a bank, they can actually have a payroll card right. was the other one. Saying that we will issue a payroll card, we may means that they may not have to have a payroll card. We used to say either you do direct deposit or you have to have a payroll card. Now they've actually considered it to be some paper check for some people. And then, so we have that, and then the benefits. There were no just small changes, nothing substantial. The papers. Uh, like Nick said, it used to be in CAPERS that you had to wait a year before becoming a member. That is no longer the case, so we had to change that. Life insurance, there were no substantial changes, just maybe some changes in wording, punctuation, that sort of thing. Deferred compensation, um, we talked about the pre-tax option and the post-tax op option, excuse me, we used to just have the pre-tax option, but now we have the Roth, so we put that in there as well. And we also changed where it said that you would get your $100 contribution by the city on the last payroll check of December. We have been doing it on maybe the first check in December, so I wanted to make sure that that matched, so I changed that. Social Security and Medicare, no changes there cafeteria plan, pre-tax benefits, no changes there. Health and dental insurance, really no changes there, just general wording changes, nothing substantial at all. Okay. And we have a purchase a police vehicle in here too, in the consent agenda. I don't know why that wouldn't be. Were we down a vehicle, Chief? Were we down one vehicle? Who said no? Yeah. I don't think so. We're actually down two vehicles okay. total in our fleet. Uh, this is not a, an addition. This is a trade-in and replacement of a vehicle that we held one extra year. And so uh, this, this vehicle has been in service for three years instead of two, which is a normal cycle. Okay. That's, that's why we only get $5,000 worth of trade-in instead of 11000 like we got last year. Base model uh, for 2020 went up $4,000. Uh, so it's getting more expensive. It's like the other SUVs, basically. It's, it's, well, it's, uh, this is for a Ford SUV. Um, it's the same vehicle, but it's a 2020 model, so uh, I don't know what the differences are. But yeah, okay. It's a little bit different model from 2019 to 2020. Okay. okay. And we are we are budgeted. I had uh, forty five thousand dollars budgeted this year for the vehicle replacement, and this is uh, going to be twenty eight thousand dollars for the expenditure. Okay. Okay. Dan made a motion. I'll second the motion on a consent agenda. Is there any other questions on it? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. There's no old business, uh, new business. So the first reading of an ordinance authorizing the rezoning of 1408, 1418, and 1420 North First Street from C2 Restricted Commercial District and R2 Medium Density Residential District to C3 General Commercial District. We've talked at length about this. 
reiterate what we what we're proposing. Um, the proposal, the request was filed by NKS Restaurant LLC for the rezoning of 1408, 1418, and 1420 North First from C2 and R2. There, there's two different zones there to C3, General Commercial District. The Planning Commission did vote to uh, recommend that you approve this at their May mm -hmm. or March. This is the property that's in question. Um, the car wash property being out on the Summit Street side and these three properties behind it, one commercial, but it's the north one and the other two actually have houses today. Um, this is the future land use map for the area. Uh, <coughs> red is commercial, blue is uh, residential. Um, of course, those houses were there when the future land use plan was done, so I think it'd be residential for red. And zoning is pretty similar. The idea is to keep the, they're going to combine all these lots together, so the idea is to keep all of them at the same zone. Uh, so that's why the C3 is red one. This is the most recent rendition of a site plan that we have. Um, we kind of cleaned it up a little bit, so we're going to look at uh, But these are some of the issues that, that have been uh, put forward. And I wanted to show you this one too. It's not the easiest to see, but it does help a little bit. Um, this shows where the uh, drive works is A. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. The drive in here, that's the existing one. The new one would be a little bit further south. Um, the island, where, where you get to the, the Y there and the traffic starts. Right in there. And so it is it is before the, the separation of traffic there. And I put this in this is actually from that traffic study that, that we've been referencing. This is that particular area. because um, I know it's in your packet and it's probably hard to see on the phone and stuff. But this is this would be the intersection of Kansas and Summit and how that particular plan would So wait, can you go back there? Yeah. So that would, the car wash, that is the Burger King air site in question where it says car wash. Mm -hmm. And it would, the, so the roads would split to two lanes that just past that? Two yeah, lanes, two lanes back going, out widen back out to two lanes south. going south, but it would already, it'd be one lane going mm -hmm. north already yes. at that point. But on that right, the, on the, Going, if they were going north on the north drive, that would actually give them the ability to stack some in that center median so they can turn left into the Burger right. King. But then, if it's on the right out only, there's no way they could go right out or but back to the left from the right out only on the south part right because they'd be crossing two double sets of yellow lines. And the other thing we can do on there, which if it ever becomes an issue with them. Trying to make a left out of that right turn only one, we could actually put up candlesticks on the roadway, which are basically a physical barrier to keep them from trying to cut through before that barrier. But so yeah, I think I'm, I can make it out now. I think what you're trying. Yeah, I can picture it. I can try to picture what it would look like on Summit. And I just had a few photos. This is of course looking at the car wash. Um, this is the lot directly behind the car wash. That would be the commercial lot. Um, it's just a, that's a lot not to set in your head. And these first two houses here are the houses that would be uh, removed by this project. This is looking off to the north along First Street. And that's Bryant Financial, I believe. We've got business there at the right. Um, other than that, it's pretty much a residential neighborhood. Looking to the south is, is also Back on the site plan, where's the fencing going to go on the site plan? <coughs> on the site plan, the fencing would go along here, here, and then the fence on this big street. So pretty much around the whole residential lots on the south, along that west property line, and then also um, it was suggested at the Planning Commission meeting to add that one along the north, and they were 
And where's well, the where's the trash cans and all that stuff that will be located at, Josh? Excuse me, Pat. Um, right here is where the trash will be right now. Okay. So the fencing, what would would it be like a privacy fence that we're talking about? Or what I've seen so far was uh, eight foot tall vinyl privacy fence. Okay. That's what it looks like right now. Would there be any way to stop people from urinating there around the trash can? Uh, no. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, cameras. Well, cameras. Cameras. Yeah, but cameras. I mean, it's at a diagonal, so there's a nice little <laughs> bathroom behind it. We could have a tie, the fence tie in, yeah. where you don't have to, that it connects to that, the fencing but to I, the trash can itself. Yeah, so that way there's no way to, to uh, have yeah, a gap in there. If you don't leave a gap, then, yeah. then there's less of a bathroom. Yeah. Or, it can't, can't you arrest people for that? Isn't that oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely can. That's right. Got to catch them, of course. Uh, yeah. Camera. <laughs> Mr. Herriter, give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> but the police have only what, a few seconds. Have you ever seen anybody go that long? No. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> well I, I don't know. I shouldn't say. I was going to say, there's going to be a donut shop across the street. I, I see Chiefs back there. That's why I said it for his benefit. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's it. I at least get a yellow warning card, right? You know, yeah. and one of the things we looked at, which we probably could have avoided the first street exit potentially, was they were actually looking for a, a, a drive that connected Casey's and Burger King together. But they were unfortunately unable to come to an agreement with um, Casey's because their fuel tanks are right there. So they didn't want a lot of traffic going over the top of those fuel tanks. But if they would have had that connection in between the two, you, we definitely could have looked at elimination of that first street exit. Possibly one of the other drives too. Probably. Yeah, and, and probably that north drive, honestly, because we probably would have just had that shared entrance that uh, Casey has currently. And Casey's fence will probably come down, would be my assumption, because they have a uh, privacy fence that goes along a portion of that as well. I think, don't they? Yeah, they have. That wood, privacy fence, yeah. yeah. So in other words, their fence come down, they'll use the other fence. Maybe, we'll have to see. They won't need the other fence in between the two structures, necessarily. But we'll, we'll reach out to Casey's and see what their plans are. For it's that actually kind of fence. unusual to have a fence there between two commercial properties. Correct. So uh, for us to approve this, we're approving the rezoning is this for sure the final site plan or is no. there more work? Uh, we will work with them to, there, I mean, there's still little stuff even for staff that hasn't fully been thought. This is, this was designed just to be kind of a general idea for just the commission to work with them. Is there anyone here from that first street neighborhood by this location? Hi. Would you like to speak? Come on up, please. I live right straight behind this home. It's a vacant lot in front of me. And I worry about it because with Casey's there the way it is, we have an awful lot of traffic on First Street. They go down first to get to Casey's and to miss the stoplight. And there's been many, many mornings that I've pulled out of my driveway, looked both ways, nothing was coming get out there and shift in to gear to take kids to school and there's somebody right on my bumper. And it's, yeah. that's an awful bad, bad street. It's really a busy street. Like I said, we've lived there since 70. I would have no objection to Burger King coming in, but I do have a big objection to them pulling out on the first street. Mm -hmm. Nobody else on my block showed up. We don't have a lot of land. I mean, there's not a lot, of, a lot of them that own their houses there. So not more in. Right. So. Where's your house located? 1417 North Burke. Which would be just, it's across from the vacant lot, or is it? Mm -hmm. 
when did when was Casey's built? I don't remember when it was built. It's been several years ago. I mean, it's been there for quite a while. I can't tell you. The yeah. Date, but it's been. Oh, I've had trash. They were talking about trash coming. We've had trash for years, and they did finally put up a trash fence around it, and we don't get as much trash, but we still do get some. But that's not. I mean, that doesn't bother me. It's the traffic. It's the traffic. And the people next door, they have three little kids. So it's just, it's just a bad street. Have you attended the planning commission meeting? No, or I never anything? have. I, okay. I'm not good at sticking up. That's okay. That's okay. But I just wanted to come tonight and hear, you know, what, how it was going to be done and where the... Have you learned... Anything that has, has eased your mind? Any? Well, I think that it would ease my mind more if there was no expert on the first. We tried to get the police department to set up a counter thing out there to see how much traffic we had. And it's not just slow traffic, it's speedy traffic. Were they, did they do that for you? No. They wouldn't do it? Okay. I don't remember ever. Here, this is the first I've heard that. Uh, it's been several years back. Okay. Okay. The same. And we could do that. We have, we have, we definitely have the means to do yeah, that. We did that on the other portion of First Street when we're, we had concerns. Okay. Well, what they want us to do is doesn't have anything to do with the First Street exit. Or what they are asking us to do tonight doesn't have anything to do with the First Street exit. We're only being asked to move it from residential to co commercial in a sense so but i understand what you're saying and i've i've worked with mr herder for some time to try and alleviate what problems could be done there as well well like yeah. taco bell they have 20 of bricks and one exit yeah that wouldn't be any problem you know they don't go out the back so Oh. Any time it's out onto a residential street, that makes it a little bit harder, I think. Well, thank you for coming up. Thank you. Okay. Scotty and Eddie, would you want to come up and say anything about this since you're on the. Yeah, I, I don't want to say anything. Uh, Scott Rogers, Planning Commission Chair. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot to say. I do know that uh, the discussion mainly had by the Planning Commission, we did hear Mr. Herder's concern, and I believe Mr. But with the other uh, citizen, he may be the neighbor, but yeah. And so, uh, I, I, I mean, the vote it was a six to one vote in favor of it. A lot of discussion had been hand with, had with regards to the uh, traffic on the first street, um, and I think through all the discussions, I think one commissioner even mentioned, you know, car wash is there, Casey's is there now. How much more traffic and light are we really adding there with the car wash? I know they can't exit off, but Casey's is there. He didn't feel like it was going to be that big a concern. Others were more concerned with it. So I think it's just kind of a, other than the traffic being somewhat brought up and mentioned, I do know they talked to him also about, I think to Mr. Herder, about moving the trash can and doing some other little things, you know, on the final plan site. But the reason I'm good to a six to one, I, I mean, I don't know if you have any questions for it. So Andy, you well, did they say on. that, that they, did they say that they didn't really need to exit on a first street? I mean, uh, a lot of things were said. They said they could get rid of it, and then they said, well, it'd be nice to have it just for congestion and traffic, not to be all on the east side. So I, I think he, they'd prefer to have it, but I mean that. One of our concerns, staff-wise, as far as Chief and I's major concerns with that north entrance and exit, um, when Summit is very congested and, and based on the way it's designed, it'll be very difficult and you'll actually probably have individuals making, taking risks that they probably wouldn't otherwise take if they had that first street exit. And so from a safety perspective, we're concerned about dumping more, more dangerous, you know, having a dangerous incident happen, which could result in an injury accident because we do know that this um, stretch of road sees you know, anywhere from 15 to 17,000 vehicles a day. It's our highest traffic um, count area. It's our highest area for injury accidents in Park City. 
And so if there's any way to try to keep people from trying to risk making that turn to the north, that first street exit, you know, unfortunately is, is the safer exit um, in those times where Summit Street's really busy. When it's not busy, honestly, I think what they stated in the uh, meeting was 70% of their traffic actually is drive-through traffic. So when you think of it from those pure numbers, most of them are going to try to get out of there as quickly as they can. They want in and in and they want out. So they're probably going to use that ride out only uh, to try to get to head south on Summit. If they just absolutely have to go north onto Summit, they're going to use that exit to go north. But if it's a dangerous situation and they know it's congested, they're not going to take that risk. Some, If they have an, another way to get out of there. And that's where that other exit on First Street really comes into play. And that's what one commissioner had said. He had also said something to the effect of, and I agree, and I, I summarize it for him. Uh, I mean, until we get the billion dollar lottery to widen some and move and get five <laughs> lanes or something through there, you're always gonna have First Street and A Street, depending on where you're at on Summit Street, as kind of the frontage off streets. I mean, if you look up and down Summit, it's there. And I think that was kind of the, kind of the, the, the sentiment of the board was, it's not ideal, but we're always going to have it until we can either get summit <laughs> extremely wide and have all the lanes and have you know right lane only, and it's always going to be first or a street as an issue or a concern, no matter what. And so, do we just, you know, I don't think they thought it was any different than anywhere else on summit. You know, it's one of those things too, they, they, like us, like Credo right. Coffee. You know, that's that's really busy during certain times. We allow them to use the alleyway to get out. You know, just to try to avoid them having to go back on the Summit Street as well. You know, and they pull in and they they're right in those people's backyards. I know it's not a front yard, but they're they're right there. Um, and uh, it, it's helped alleviate some of our issues with with crashes. But honestly, like uh, Mr. Roger or Dr. Roger was was saying, in a perfect world, you know, we'd have a five five lane. Uh, roadway on Summit, and then we wouldn't even be talking about First Street. But it's just, it's just planning on. The lottery yet. Well, I, the lottery doesn't even matter. It just, it, there's just so many concerns, and we think that safety net, from a staff perspective, is that First Street exit, and that's how we viewed it. I mean, we wish we wouldn't have to have it necessarily, but I think just to prevent, you know, those individuals from taking unnecessary, unnecessary risks. That's really kind of our, our safety cushion. And that's why we talked about fencing. You know, we don't want people to see it. We've already talked to them about the build, the lights on their building. We want them to make sure they're not, you know, an area light that's shining out into the neighbors, but actually have it where it's downlit. And so they're cognizant about that. Um, and having a solid white vinyl fence will help, especially if it's eight foot tall. And we'll be able to see that on the plans. Um, if that's what they discussed, we'll be able to see that and, and recommend it to them. But um, it, it's not perfect, um, but we're trying to make it as safe as we possibly can, given the circumstances. Chief Ward has talked about the, uh, the injury accidents on that stretch of summit, and that's kind of like a pressure relief to keep some of that yeah. from happening. And, and it's not just the number of accidents, it's the severity of the accidents that happen there. And if we're not having that much dangerous traffic, hopefully in the, the horrible times when those accidents happen, because it's not a, the same times when they're happening, they can get back on the first street and relieve that a little bit. And that's kind of the way we look at it um, when we look at this as a planning committee. So it's not convenient for the people that live there. It's not. But it's the best of a tough situation. told the planning commission estimated 480 customers a day and they'd be open till midnight and there's going to be a lot of lights if they're open till midnight going to that just to let you know those were the numbers that
days of the planning commission. So we were also told 80 a day too. So yeah, think about it. Thank you. Well, since we're since this is just the rezoning part of it tonight, I make a motion we consider the first reading ordinance authorizing the rezoning 1408, comma 1418 and 1420 North First Street from a C2 restricted commercial district and R2 medium density residential district to a C3 a general uh, commercial district. I'll second it. It's been moved a second. Any more discussion on it? Uh, I'd like to see. I mean, if the developer can see if they if they need that uh, that entrance. I would too. I mean, if, if Taco Bell can do it with one. Although Burger yeah. King wants to be busier than Taco Bell, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll ask them. The other thing that'll be nice about this, what I'm thinking about, it, this will probably relieve uh, some of the sonic congestion. People going uh, going south on Summit, they're not going to go to Sonic now. They're going to go to Burger King. They've got the same pub. Yeah, exactly. Maybe they'll have yeah. happier hour. You <laughs> know what we what we do need to have a discussion at some point in the future in regards to Summit Street, mm -hmm. um, because <clears throat> we'll just, I'll just give you a little yeah. update. Chief and I we've looked at that. The traffic injury accidents and the traffic accidents has not decreased, and we enforce that area tremendously i mean you can't hardly go on that stretch of road and not see an officer almost all day long <coughs> so that's not deferring or, or deterring any of these accidents from happening so we know that from an enforcement perspective we're gonna have to do something else and the next step is looking at engineering of that road and design of the roadway so that study we did a year and a half ago was just the traffic on that it was just for that corridor from Kansas mm -hmm. Avenue to Radio Lane. Right. Okay. And we received a grant from the Kansas Department of Transportation to look at that um, so, right away. If we took Mr. Rainier's suggestion, though, to have no left turns, you'd get even more traffic on A. You would have a first. bigger problem yes. because then you'd have a lot of people. A lot of people around. have to go around there. <laughs> you'd have a lot of people breaking the laws, which you'd have. Yeah, well, unless you put a, a solid medium in there. <laughs> Concrete in. Yeah. The one issue you'll have if you do no. put a solid median in there, then is you're going to have a lot of upset business owners because you're taking away potential mm -hmm. customers because it's way more inconvenient for them. Yeah. So if they're if you're going to visit with them about whether or not they have to have first. So sh should we table it? I'm sorry, motion, second. Oh, motion, okay. second. Yeah. But that's a site plan. You know, this is the zoning, which is a little bit different. So the site plan hasn't been 100% approved uh, for them. I think they're asking just for it, their property be all rezoned, and then we'll have to get the site plan approved, and, and we'll visit with them, and we'll ask them point blank, you know, do you need first street exit? But from my perspective, you know, staff recommendation, Chief and I, that like they even the planning commissioners stated it is a pressure release valve on First Street. It really is. It's it's trying to reduce the number of potential accidents. And yes, um, Taco Bell um, up north, it has it, but it doesn't have the number of you know more businesses in that right you know right in that compact area. I think next door they have a heating and air business and then they across the street mm -hmm. they have um, subway which has two inch or has an entrance and exit has an exit on the back side of the road as well and so uh, it doesn't go down to a anything it just it, comes out no, into it, that little y no yeah it comes out into the y into that residence yeah. but there's a residence i believe on that area yeah that was, that was kind of the summit is if you look up in that summit you have a or first street almost there but i mean yes yeah. that have it I think that's it's Random Road, everywhere. I think is what the name of that road it's is. It's a, yeah, Random Road. And that was kind of the sentiment of the board was, I mean, it's kind of this way yeah. all along until you get the historical kind of down, downtown of the chestnut. Mm -hmm. I kind of 
I'd like to hear what they have to say about the first straight pain. But this Is there any other questions? Nothing from us. Okay, if not, it's a roll call vote. Commissioner Smith? Yes. Commissioner Gander? No. Commissioner Yakovic? Yes. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, number two. Consider approval of city insurance coverage for property, liability, or business liability. Um, it is that type of year for our renewals. One of the things we did have and you'll notice is that there is a, a substantial increase from current insurance to our upcoming renewal. The reason for that is um, the values of a couple properties. Water treatment facility increased about four million dollars um, and the uh, wastewater treatment plant increased almost 2.7 million dollars. So that is why the um, commercial property insurance went up. It's just a lot more value. We are actually disputing that $21.6 million on the water treatment facility because it was actually constructed for less than $17 million all in all. So um, we just don't understand where they came up with, with that number. So we are um, in negotiations with them to decrease that, which will decrease that overall commercial property um, line item. The increase in auto um, that you see here. Uh, is due to uh, our new rescue pumper and our brush truck that are brand new versus those two items that were substantially depreciated out. Uh, we also have a new flatbed dump truck and also the new bucket truck for the uh, parks department. So that's why that line item went up. So basically those two line items are the, are the bulk of the increase and those are the reasons behind the increase. We did visit with United Agency and we have both agreed, United Agency and the city, that we are going to go out for bid next year and try to uh, get multiple insurance companies to make proposals for us for next year. So I need uh, commission approval uh, to accept the insurance for 2019. I would so move that we approve the uh, city insurance coverage for property, liability, vehicles, and equipment for an amount not to exceed $275,744. Second. What? I added. They always have to add different different equipment and stuff like that. But just for the year, that extends to their life. I oh, not exclude their debt. Well, what it's showing here, it's not in here, but. Yeah, what I'm seeing here on this. If you can okay. renegotiate the okay. amount of the water treatment facility, yeah. that should go down. Yeah, on what Kathy's, I think, referring to is we have vehicles come on, vehicles come off, so that dollar amount's going to shift some. She just doesn't want to lock it in as being the, the end-all, be-all for the whole year. But as today, as it stands, we agree to the renewal for this amount because that's what it is so, to us today. Okay, so what's linebacker? Uh, linebacker is basically, um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I believe it's for technology. Um, we added that a few years ago. What was that? Linebacker policy. I mean, we don't even have a football team. No, no. <laughs> I'm the city. Now we've had it since 15. Yeah, that's a low cost line there. Yeah. Uh, protection <laughs> against liability and defense costs for wrongful acts of policyholders that may occur through the process of conducting business. Actual or alleged errors, misstatements, or misleading statements, acts or omissions, and neglect or breach of duty by the policyholder. It's errors and omissions. Errors, errors and omissions. Yeah. Okay. It's just called linebacker. Okay. Yep. Um, cyber solutions. Have they paid us anything for our email problems? We haven't had any. That was actually would would be through um, Cox Cable. Okay. Cox Cable was the 
accounts it's for the server where we had issues with our email addresses actually going all out to everywhere and that's why you get spam from us okay. that happened about two years ago I believe but the uh, spam does come up from time to time still from that issue but this is really protection against individuals that may put ransomware on the computer and want you to uh, basically um, pay money out or if we have a release of information out to protect us and cover us as well. Okay. So we got a motion second we're, and we're going to use the figure what? Uh, yeah, the 275, 744. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Thoughts, voice vote, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Number three. Consider authorizing the mayor and or city staff to sign a land and water conservation plan grant application from the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism with increased funds awarded to the American Chippewa Water Development Park Master Plan. Uh, what this is basically giving us authorization, like she stated, to apply for a land water conservation fund for Wilson Park. It's three hundred thousand dollars to go towards the splash pad, um, and we're working on it. The deadline's actually, I believe, in two weeks, but we hope to have it with commission approval submitted um, this week. Um, we do have approximately about eight hundred thousand already um, contributed towards the project. So with this portion, we should be able to get uh, the splash pad done, but. We're also applying for a grant in August for all the walking paths in, in there as well. And so hopefully that grant will cover all the walking paths. <coughs> How much is that grant going to be? In the, for the walking paths, yeah. that we're still working on that, okay. determining what the final cost is going to be on that. Um, but that's due in August is when that grant will be, and it's a recreational trail grant. Um, but, but between the two and working with some of our local providers, we should be able to get, hopefully, everything completed in that park with the exception of the playground so and the the park is already part of the land, land water. and water conservation fund. yes sir so, so we don't have to redesignate the park it's already eligible to receive all those funds and uh, when we build the splash pad it's a nice idea but do have we calculated our annual maintenance costs? That's something that's actually um, been looked at and and um, it depends upon usage, but I'll have to get that number when the when the individuals get here, the um, splash pad consultants arrive. Okay. But I would say it's probably gonna be underneath $10,000 a year. Really? Guess. Less than 10,000 a year mm -hmm. to maintain that? Yep. Yep. No way. <laughs> I just yeah. All right, that's awesome. Man. Do we? Do well, we I also? Think that, I think that was the number that we we had initially saw was around that ten thousand dollar figure for the year because it does not use a lot of water. It actually recirculates the water, and then it goes through a filtration system and adds okay. um, um, chlorine, you know, type of mm -hmm. chlorine to it. So there's not a lot of cost. So it's just a chemical just cost. A little bit of chemical, a little bit of electricity. Yeah. And I know our chemical cost for the swimming pool, which is eight hundred fifty thousand gallons a year. It's around ten thousand dollars a year. So right. this is chemical, and I figured it would be staff time to go out and look at the pumps and make sure they're operating properly. Hmm. Do we also have uh, the farmers, farmers market? market first? Farmers market's going to be they they will not fund the farmers market. It's not a eligible project for land water conservation fund. It helps us elevate all the rest of the park funds with the recreational trails and the splash pad. Helps elevate the priority for those. Um, but we're working right now with a local company to help basically build that that area for us. Okay. Well, I move we authorize Mayor Jay Warren and or city staff to sign the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant application from the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks, and Tourism with any grant funds awarded to be directed to phase one of the Wilson Park Master Plan, splash pad slash interactive fountain and restrooms, and execute any and all other documents as necessary to apply for said grant. And I'll second that. Is there any discussion on it? If not, the voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Sir, uh, manager updates. Uh, spring clean-up day is this Saturday at 8 a.m. Um, we'll meet at the Rotunda. 
they'll be serving breakfast uh, for the volunteers uh, in the rotunda and then they'll split out and go work from basically 9 a.m. to noon um, if the weather's good and as of right now it looks like the weather's going to be pretty darn good. What are you cooking? I don't think <laughs> yeah it's donuts okay. is what, we, what they give them. Uh, but then citywide cleanups the following week so Monday through uh, Friday <clears throat> the citywide cleanup. Uh, <clears throat> there is going to be an event uh, for the National Volunteer Week kickoff. She explained a little bit about it but it's from 11 to 2 p.m. Uh, in Island Park in Winfield on Saturday. Uh, also, outstanding student nominees reception will be 6 o'clock on Monday, this coming Monday. So that's where they announce the uh, nominees for the the award, outstanding student awards. And that's um, going to be at the uh, Brown Center? In the it'll be at the Brown Center in the theater. It'll be in the theater area. And that's what six is that? I mean, Monday is? Monday the 8th. Okay. 6 p.m. Um, City's also going to play host to Rice Cali County Health Coalition meeting next Tuesday at 10 a.m. It'll be at the water treatment facility. Uh, and then we have our next quarterly traffic safety committee, April uh, Friday, April 12th at 10 a.m. Uh, and we also uh, canceled this evening our study session for the 12th. And we'll have our budget retreat Saturday at 9 a.m. April 13th at the um, cabin. What time was your traffic safety committee meeting on the 12th? 10 a.m. Okay. What time are we starting the retreat? Um, 9 a.m. is when we'll start. Mm -hmm. We'll probably start eating probably hmm. 8 30, well, 9. So and by 9 30, we'll be, we'll be, right. we'll be <laughs> really starting by 9 30. The goal is to be out there by 1, 2 o'clock, is the goal. So. Unless you want to stay all day. Unless Jake cooks his yeah. dinner. Well, he, we did that that first year. We were there all the way through <laughs> all, dinner and yeah, all the way. evening. Yeah, it was actually, that was fun. It was a lot of fun. So we can do whatever we want, as long as it takes. Okay. we got to cook our dinner, then we'll or catch our dinner and cook it. We'll catch it and yeah. cook it. All right. And that is it. All right, I move we adjourn. Second. Call favor, say